Well, good morning. morning. You might notice I'm up here all by my lonesome this morning. Uh, Megan is on sabbatical, in case you haven't heard, and Kyle is off on vacation this week, um, and so we will pray with her in that. But I'm glad that we get to be together this morning. Um, Whether you are here in the sanctuary, if you are joining us online or watching later, uh, it is just a gift uh, to be able to join in worship. Uh, If you are here for the first time, we would love for you to fill out a visitor's card, and you can place that in the offering basket as they are passed um, so we can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, This morning, as we continue our series on building bridges, Uh, and open ourselves to being surprised by mustard seeds, Uh, I invite us to enter into worship with an excerpt from the prayer, Prophets of a Future Not Our Own, uh, which is attributed to Oscar Romero. Uh, So let us hear these words. Uh, This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. Uh, We are prophets of a future, not our own. Amen. Let us worship God together. Faith while trees are still in blossom blends the picking When the buds begin to sprout Long before the dawn is breaking Faith anticipates the sun Faith is eager for the daylight For the work that must be Faith believes that God is faithful. God will be what God will be. Faith accepts the call responding. I am willing, Lord, send me. You may be seated. As we enter into this time of prayer, we give thanks uh, for God that meets us here and shares our prayers with us, uh, those we will share out loud, those that we are holding on to, uh, even those that we are finding our words for. Uh, It's a gift to be in prayer together, and so we lift up a few specific prayer requests. Um, As mentioned, Kyle is on vacation this week. They are on their way right now to Tybee Island to spend a few days at the beach. Um, So our prayers go with her um, as she travels with her family, uh, and that this prayer this week might be restful and restorative. Uh, Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, we pray this morning in the wake of another school shooting, um, this one at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. Uh, for those families and communities that are grieving, uh, we pray for God to draw near. Um, for the sickness that plagues us all, we pray we might find our cure. Um, and that our prayers might be spoken in our actions. Uh, We say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Uh, Destiny McKenzie, who is a friend of Fran, has been diagnosed with cancer and will need treatment. Uh, So we pray with Destiny for her strength and courage um, and sustaining mercies for her fiance, Marquise, and their three children, her three children. Uh, Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, Denise Lambrianu's friends, Samantha and Zachary Berry, lost their almost five-month-old baby, Eli, last week. Um, He had a congenital heart defect. Um, So prayers uh, for love and peace to surround them in their unimaginable grief. Uh, Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, Cheryl Meredith fell and broke her hip uh, last Sunday and had surgery. 
Um, she was in the hospital for a couple days and then um, will be at Greenwood Rehab most likely. And so we pray with Cheryl um, for her strength and her recovery. Uh, Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, Jen Adams' mom, Jean Adam, is still recovering from numerous serious infections. And it will be a couple more months before she will be able to return home. Um, and so our prayers are with Jean as she continues to recover uh, and with Jen as she cares for her mom in this time. Uh, Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, and then on this Memorial Day weekend, we, we remember those who have lost their lives in service of our country. Uh, and so we pray in their memory this morning uh, for a world of wholeness and of peace. Uh, Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, let us continue in this spirit of prayer together. Today's morning prayers is uh, inspired by a hymn for the healing of the nations. Good morning, holy God. Thank you for this day, and thank you for you in this day. You are father, mother. You are our very breath. You are the light in our darkness, truth amidst our lies, peace in our violence, comfort in our grief, forgiveness in our sin, compassion in our hate. You are God in your redeeming, restoring, reviving, and redirecting our lives toward witness and service. So we gather here today as your children, as your church, rejoicing in your grace. For the healing of the nations, God, we pray with one accord. For the healing of body and mind and heart and soul, for the healing of families, communities, governments, nations, even the healing of the forces of nature, Lord, hear our prayer. For a just and equal sharing of the things that earth affords to a life of love and action, help us rise and pledge our word. All that kills abundant living let it from the earth be banned. Pride of status, race, schooling, dogmas that obscure your plan. In our common quest for justice, may we hallow life's brief span. You, Creator God, have written your great name on humankind. For our growing in your likeness, bring the life of Christ to mind that by our response and service, earth its destiny may find. Lord, hear our prayer. And holy God, we pray in behalf of those who cannot pray, those who refuse to pray, for those who have lost hope in you, in humanity, in life itself. We lift also those who are the victims of nature's destructive forces and victims of human greed, lust, and violence. Lord, hear our prayers. And when we rise from our worship of you, may we become your prayer to others. For what was, for what is, for what will be, we give you thanks, our God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. At this time, our children are invited to worship and wonder.
Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnets sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of the Amen. Thank you. This morning we're invited to hear some good news from the gospel according to Mark, uh, chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. He also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on the earth, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. 
One spring while I was in seminary, a friend of mine at the Disciples Divinity House knocked on my door. He said, you like Wendell Berry, so you must know something about building a garden. You want to help me? I looked at him, honored at the invitation. I said, correction, I love Wendell Berry. I know nothing about building a garden, but I would be glad to help you out. And so we set out to build a garden at the disciples' house. And I want to be clear, we had no idea what we were doing, and we put very little thought into the plan for how we were actually going to do it. We generally knew what we needed, a space to plant, which we had in a square patch of grass. We knew we'd need dirt, which we acquired by renting a pickup truck, going to some dirt store and filling the back of it up. Spoiler alert, we did not need that much dirt. <laughs> and we knew we'd need some seeds, which we bought at a, bu a bunch of at a local nursery. Okra, eggplant, kale, carrots, tomatoes, peppers, basil, Pick something off the salad bar, we probably tried to plant it. We also kind of figured we should have some sort of container for the garden, like a raised bed. And instead of a wooden raised bed, which is fairly simple to build and fairly inexpensive, we went to Lowe's and we bought a bunch of cinder block for our garden bed, which is heavy and exhausting to move, especially when it's 85 degrees and humid in Nashville. Did I mention we had no idea what we were doing? But y'all, we did it anyway. We placed that cinder block about too high in that patch of land. We shoveled out the dirt and filled it up. We scattered some seeds borderline aimlessly, and then we let it do its thing. We watered it when we remembered to, sometimes both of us on the same day. We checked on it occasionally, and then I left to go to camp for the summer assuming I would come back to a bunch of dead plants. I guess our farmers and gardeners and botanists in the room are thinking, uh, you think? That is not the way you build a garden. You don't just toss a bunch of seeds in the backyard and then leave it. You organize it. You make neat rows and well-manicured beds. You check the weather constantly. You protect it from birds and insects and you fertilize it and pull the weeds. We're supposed to be particular and meticulous. I agree. I know. I was under no assumption that this was going to work. We were just eager and excited to plant some seeds and so we just did it. So I'm sure you could imagine my surprise when I came back after my summer at camp to see that the garden was flourishing. I didn't know okra plants grew this high or produce so much. We had tomatoes and eggplants that could feed the entire house. It was outrageous. It was an impossible masterpiece. Gardening and growing earthy plant metaphors and parables are a popular theme in Jesus' teaching. In fact, the only kingdom parables in the Gospel of Mark involve seeds. What is the kingdom of God like? It's a good question to which Jesus answers with a couple parables. Those pesky parables, those challenging, elusive, indirect, yet pointed and powerfully relevant parables. To what can we compare the kingdom of God? Well, first, the kingdom of God is like a gardener that scatters some seeds and then goes off to sleep, leaving the seeds to do whatever it is that seeds do. We're not told that he waters them or nurtures them, just that he sleeps. He wakes up and sees the seed sprout and doesn't know how. I feel you, buddy. When the time comes, the gardener harvests it. The second parable, we're told that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that someone has planted. And that the tiniest of seeds grows into a giant tree so big and bountiful that it is a sanctuary for the birds. So the kingdom of God is like a sleeping gardener, mysterious soil, an invasive weed, and a flock of birds. It doesn't make any sense. These are outrageous images. So I'm guessing Jesus was not a botanist. We've already established that to plant seeds, we're supposed to be meticulous and intentional, not just throwing them around and going to sleep. And then a mustard seed. As A.J. Levine explains, Mustard seeds do not grow into giant trees. 
There's the black mustard seed, which sprouts into a plant that can grow given perfect agricultural conditions, about eight to 10 feet. But even still compared to a sequoia, for example, that grows 300 feet, or a white oak that on average grows 80 to 100 feet, the mustard tree is relatively small. I think the term tree might even be a little generous. Not only that, mustard is a weed, and a really obnoxious and stubborn one at that. If a first century gardener in Palestine were foolish enough to plant it, it would quickly take over their lands. Imagine a gardener today planting dandelions or broomweed. These are commonplace nuisances that we try to get rid of, not plants we would want to cultivate on purpose. And then if that's not enough, let's just add in a bunch of birds. What is the kingdom of God like? It is a gardener taking the risk to plant seeds even if they don't understand. It is a surprising and thriving burst of life in conditions where life shouldn't be able to grow. It is slow, unnoticeable, mysterious growth. It is a tiny seed growing beyond what we have determined is its capacity. It is the unwanted plant becoming the greatest of all shrubs. It is a weed that runs wild and nourishes. It is a home, a shelter, a sanctuary. It is impractical, it is outrageous, it is beyond our imagination. It is an impossible masterpiece. Jesus gives his listeners a lesson in faith. Imagine bigger and bolder and wilder, and when the world tries to limit it, be witnesses to a faith that sprouts anyways. It doesn't make any sense. And yet the task is to scatter the seeds, to build the bridges, to show up at the table, and then see what God can do with that. I didn't want to talk about a school shooting this morning. I don't want to think about 19 children and two teachers being killed. And I guess it would have been just as easy to ignore it because it is such a routine part of our living these days. And if it's not this one, it's another one, or it's something else that seeks to separate us from each other, from, the lo- from each other and the love of God. And so I am tired, and I'm heartbroken, and I'm angry, and I'm sad, and I'm out of words to make any good sense of it. I imagine this week being a kid again. I think of our kids, joyful and playful and hopeful, and I imagine them taking that dandelion and blowing those fluffy seeds and making a wish. Have you ever made a wish on a dandelion? I grieve this world that works so hard to take that innocence, that joy, that life away. I think about those life-limiting and death-dealing systems of being told that dandelions are just a weed, don't blow that stuff everywhere. And then I think about what Jesus tells us God can do with a weed. Thank goodness for a God that says, I don't always need you to make sense of things. Thank goodness for a God that simply says, I just need you. I need you to scatter some seeds of love and of justice, of hope and compassion. God says, pick that dandelion and blow it with the biggest breath you can muster, and I will take care of it from there. This is a risky invitation because not everyone likes weeds. And it is a scary invitation because it calls us into this realness of faith, which is kind of blurry and uncertain. And yet we know we can't let fear keep us from living into this sleeping gardener and mustard seed kind of faith. No, we can't let fear keep us from what God God calls us to, whether it is fear of being wrong, fear of embarrassment, of messing up, of giving up control, or that terrifying uncertainty. Y'all, faith isn't certainty. It is showing up for the mystery. It is claiming and trusting a God that can take the seeds that no one wanted planted and then making a life-giving, life-sustaining, life-changing home out of the weeds. What is the kingdom of God like? 
Jesus tells us it is surprising and it is subversive, it is impractical and illogical, it turns the barriers and boundaries and expectations upside down, it is an abundant, full and thriving life for all of God's people on earth as it is in heaven. This is the faith that the Gospels call us into. It is a faith that looks at a world of complacency, a world that says love can't grow here and start scattering seeds anyways. That looks at a world that says the divide is too wide and builds a bridge anyways. That hears the world saying there's not enough room for everyone and then dares to show up at, to a table anyways. Like taking a seed that grows into a bush and turning it into a massive tree, God is always up to something. We get to plant the seed. We plant the seed in spite of the fact that we don't know yet what will come of it. It is a faithful risk to be co-creators with God, knowing our role is to live with love and that God's role is to transform that love into a world where all can flourish. We lay the bricks. God is the architect. We are the gardeners. And even if we don't know what we're doing or don't think that we're good at it, God can grow something from that. These parables remind us that the kingdom of God is not just a miracle happening out in the great beyond. It is ordinary. It starts small until it is something magnificent surprising us, growing literally right in our backyard from seeds that we have planted. In the grand scheme of bridge building, of kingdom building, we get to do the hard work. The fun work, the life-giving work, the faithful work of planting seeds even if we're not sure what will happen. Towards the end of, my, of the summer, my friend and I cooked a full meal out of what we grew. We had to buy the Parmesan cheese. You can't grow cheese. We cooked eggplant Parmesan and fried okra. We grew the tomatoes, the eggplant, the basil, the okra. And then we sat around a table and we laughed about all of it. It didn't make any sense then. It doesn't make any sense now. And yet what mattered then and what matters now is the breaking of bread, the cultivating of joy, the audacity to dream of a world where all can thrive, to believe in love and possibility, and then having the courage to act in faith. Our challenge remains, church to scatter the seed and rest in God's grace and creativity, to lean into this bizarre and outrageous kingdom that God dreams of, to plant the seeds with love and with hope and in the midst of all of it. We keep claiming boldly and loudly to a world that wants to limit it yet needs to hear it, that the God of the tiniest seed scattered is the God of the impossible and magnificent harvest. Amen.
What is the kingdom of God like? In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Much like gardening, I don't know much about baking bread, but as someone who believes in the importance of tables, I know a little bit about breaking bread. When the early church gathered to worship, they did so over full meals. Bread was first broken in the ancient world, in Jesus' world, for one reason, to welcome one another. Why else would you literally break off a piece of bread except to share it? The sharing signaled what the time was about. It was a time of sharing life together. So often we look beyond for how God is at work among us, and then we meet these odd parables that bring us back to a loaf of bread. That remind us that the kingdom of God is something that is shared. It's something we glimpse in those moments around tables where we hear an invitation that says all are welcome, where our imaginations are expanded, our lives rooted in openness. It is around a table where we experience in its fullness a God that calls us beloved, where we, where we learn to look at one another and see each other with that same grace. Church and bread, we know life. In cup, we know love. Around a table, we get a glimpse and a taste of God's dream for the world. It all starts with an invitation that says, you are loved and you are welcome here. And so we remember. It's on that night, Jesus gathered with his friends and his disciples and he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it He said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it out. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Each time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. This is the bread of life, the cup of God's love for you. All are welcome at Christ's table. Let us pray. God of love, we give you thanks for this bread of life, for this cup of your love for us, for this table to which all are welcome. We show up this morning hearing that invitation that says we are invited and we are loved here. Uh, May we know it. May we experience you in this bread and in this cup, in those ordinary moments of sharing life together, uh, knowing that you can take the ordinary and make it so remarkably holy. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
for the uh, invitation to offering this morning, I'd like to share something with you about my tenure as the chair of your church board. Late in 2020, Megan asked if I would serve on the church board in 2021 as chair elect and then 2022 as the board chair. And after some serious and prayerful and thoughtful consideration, I agreed. And then she told me she was taking her sabbatical in 2022. So, you know, that happened. But Megan did express a little concern about me. She said, you know, Bob, you're still in your honeymoon phase at First Christian. You love everything and everybody. When you serve a year as the board chair, you're going to see how the sausage is made at church. And uh, she was a little concerned about me. But I have two pushbacks about that. The first is I'm at least 20 years older than her. And I was being exposed to the seedy underbelly of church polity when she was still wearing diapers. But <laughs> the, the second pushback is far more important. Because I am now nearly halfway through my tenure as your board chair. And I only love you more. I only love you more. Because I'm on the board chair, I sit on the finance committee meetings, and I see your faithful giving, and it makes me love you more. And I see the leadership that's offered by our church staff day to day in the office. Uh, you know, we spend money every week out of this church office, and I watch committee members and their chairs making decisions about how that money is spent with a mind and a heart and a soul of stewardship. They know that this was money given to God to advance God's kingdom, and they are going to treat it that way. And every day of the week in this church, you can see members and friends coming and going, donating their time, their talents, their elbow grease, their shoe leather, their backs and their knees, and all kinds of things like that in order that we can minister and show love from our doorsteps to the end of the earth. And so my invitation to offering this morning is simply, I love you. I love you. So let's pray together God's blessings on our offering this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, our hearts of gratitude bring us to this place. And we are grateful for all of the good gifts that come down to us from you, the Father of light. And our prayer is simple. With our hearts of gratitude, show us your way, and we will follow. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we leave this morning, we have a couple of announcements to share with you. Uh, we have a few new summer studies slash small groups uh, starting soon. 
There's a Talking with God Bible study that will be facilitated by Melissa Rudloff, and that's a six-week study that begins on Tuesday, June 7th, and that'll be from 10.30 to 11.30 in the parlor. Um, that one you can just show up to uh, when you are able. Um, it's not a continuous study, so you can jump right in and pick up wherever folks are. Uh, and then Mike Morris will be leading a three-week small group based on the book We Were Spiritual Refugees by Katie Hayes. Uh, this is the other book Megan invited folks to read as part of her sabbatical. And then Reverend Hayes will actually be with us in worship uh, preaching on July 17th. Uh, that group begins on Sunday, June 12th, following worship. Uh, let me know if you'd like to participate in that, and I can get you a book. And then if you aren't able to participate in it but would like to read the book, let me know, and I will get you a book. Um, there is a children's ministry outing to Cheney's Dairy Barn on Sunday, June 12th at 4 p.m., so mark your calendars for that. And then speaking of children ministry things, uh, Vacation Bible School uh, is Friday evening, July 8th, and then all day on July 9th. Uh, and then we mentioned our Habitat build last week, which is July 15th and 16th. Uh, you will be able to find a sign-up in this coming week's e-news. Uh, and if you have any trouble with that signing up, please let me know, uh, because I think Kyle mentioned we need 600 volunteers for that, so we will take all of the help we can get. Uh, would you rise, embody your spirit for our benediction, and then I will invite you to stay standing as we sing together our closing hymn. Our benediction this morning is adapted from some words written by Nadia Bowles Weber, so I will send you with this. This is it. This is the life we get here on earth. We get to give away what we receive. We get to believe in each other. We get to love imperfectly, and we never know what effect it will have for years to come, and all of it, all of it is completely worth it. Thanks, God. Go in peace. Praise God.